and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, won't you choose it? So I'm going to make sure I sanitize this for you. Uh, but hey, we want to welcome you guys to Center Point Church. We're glad you're here as everyone trickles in. Um, we got a couple quick announcements for you. Uh, first and foremost, I got this paper right here. I believe it's an insert in your bulletin about the new attendees meet and greet. Uh, if you are new to Pagosa, new to Center Point, you want to get to know what we are about as a church, our vision get to know the pastors a little bit and the ministries going on in this place, we want to invite you next Sunday after the service into the library, or the fellowship hall, my apologies, uh, for a couple snacks. We want to answer any questions you have, want to get to know you a little bit. So mark that on your calendars for next Sunday, okay? The other thing, we got another slide coming up, uh, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And let me just say something about our church. You guys give and give and give, not just financially. Right there, our goal was $22,000, and we surpassed that this year. Every single year, we set the mark even higher, and uh, you guys come through to pour into missionaries across the world through this offering, and it is amazing to see what we can do as a church not just here in town, but across the world when it comes to getting the gospel reached to people. And it's amazing what we, we can do as we work together. So um, let's go ahead and take a few minutes as we uh, do a meet and greet, get to know somebody new around you, shake a hand, get to know a new face, and uh, take a minute or two. Thanks.
Hey, I got a one last announcement intro into what we're doing next. Um, we have a couple special guests here. One of our born and raised Center Point kids, Tim Shepherdson, and his new bride, Kelsey. Uh, they're going to come up in a second. We want to show you guys a short clip uh, from Outdoor Adventures, one of our uh, partner ministries with the goal. Uh, to end father, the fatherless epidemic here in our country and around the world. And so we're going to show you guys a short two-minute clip on a, uh, a trailer for a video coming up, a documentary that we've been working on with Outdoor Adventures. And then Tim and Kelsey are going to come up right after that and share their hearts of what this next year looks like through the refuge and some of the backpacking trips, the walkabouts we do and all that. So take a, take a look at this clip. God has a great commandment, which is to love him with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and to love your neighbor. God also has the great commission, which is to go and make disciples of all nations, everybody, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we also have something in James 1.27, which is what I call the great mandate, and that is God's heart for the broken for the orphan and the widow. Fatherlessness is absolutely an epidemic. This has no respecter of race or you know, religion or socioeconomic bounds. It's a plague on this country like I've never seen before. The 21st century version of the widow is the single mom and the orphan is that fatherless kid. The thing that, that the father imparts into the home is a sense of identity for the home. And I always think, well, why didn't I want to get involved in the street gangs. I knew them guys, I could have. That started as a young age with a father who was willing to throw the ball with me. But what if you don't have a father that's willing to throw the ball to you? Kids are at home by themselves and they don't feel that love. So what they do is they go outside the streets and find that. And the gangs, drugs, alcohol, violence, because they want to belong to something. What would it look like if the men's ministries of the churches in this country would be more intentional about identifying the fatherless in their ranks and filling in the gap by providing a positive, godly male figure that could put their arm around that boy and raise him up? Our mission is to erase the fatherless epidemic through mentorship. I want this to be a bookmark between chapter 7 and 8 in your life where the rest of your life looking back on this experience you can say this is when I became a man because I chose to become a man and put away childish things and I chose to pursue God with all of my heart and to be his student and to be a disciple. You're learning to cling to the Lord. It's the number one ingredient of being a man. It's learning to rely upon him for strength. He is your strength. Center point. Well, thanks, John. <laughs> so, what you just saw there is a trailer for this upcoming documentary that's going to be showing March 29th at, or 31st, excuse me, 31st, 6:30 p.m. And if you see on, it should be in your bulletin. There's these like fancy QR codes in the corners of it. And if you take your phone out, you can scan that, and you can RSVP. RSVP in, is necessary in order to attend. It's free, but you still need to go online and do that. And if you don't know how to use a QR code, you can go talk to Ethan, the youth pastor, and uh, he'll show you how. Um, yeah, so Eric and Cameron are going to come up. Uh, they're the directors for Outdoor Adventures, and they're going to um, show the... Uh, trailer for us and the actual documentary and yeah they'll be here there can be up to 450 people here so don't worry invite all your friends and yeah come out for that so my wife and I we're the new refuge directors for outdoor adventures and outdoor adventures is this organization where we take kids and we partner with um, these mentorship organizations so we take both the kids and the mentors backpacking. So it's not like just like a week spiritual high and then they go back to normal life. We take both the kids and the mentors uh, for a week up here in the mountains and develop the relationship between them 
like each other and God so that they learn how to what it looks like to be a man of God and um, just really it's amazing what a week in the wilderness will do to grow that relationship you know because they'll be working with a kid for years and they'll say they make the most progress with a the kid they've been working with out in the woods for that week so it's amazing like just getting them away from their normal environment and how they're able to um, connect with their mentors we have 12 trips planned this summer I've got uh, five guides working with me and we're going to alternate trips and uh, yeah it's going to be a busy summer over 10 organizations we've partnered with that are going to come uh, bring their kids and their mentors for backpacking now this year we have a new base camp for these trips it's down in Chama New Mexico that's where Kelsey and I live and we have so much to do at this new base camp there's like new deck we need to remodel the whole garage to make it a game room um, so that's what uh, my wife Kelsey will talk about at the end is we're gonna have a big move-in day uh, where we'll need as much help as we can get for moving in but for now here's my wife Kelsey and she'll talk about what she does Hi, everybody. Um, so I get to do more of the administrative side of outdoor adventures. I get to connect with the mentors and their groups that are coming in. Um, I get to help also organize Friday night meals. For some of you, you might have helped in the past. We will be uh, looking for volunteers on, for Friday night meals. I address any of the allergies that are coming on each trip and make sure that the food is suitable for them. Um, and then I do sort of the background work. I make sure that the groceries are bought, um, that we have the right bedding for everybody, um, and that everybody's needs are met. Um, I also have started doing the online social media. So if you don't follow us on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, please go follow us, join us, tell your friends. Um, we need all the likes we can get at this point. But each week we have information about what we're doing, uh, statistics about the fatherless and the epidemic that's going on and then we also have just ways you can get involved um, and then if you're on LinkedIn we also have the Alliance that you can join and follow and um, and so another thing that I get to do is um, go out with the girls so the fatherless what you saw in the film is mostly young men coming but we have a group of girls that come each year and get to go out into the wilderness just like the men and learn to be what a woman of God looks like and so you get to see uh, that's our group from last year we had a year before and so hopefully this year I'll get to join them again um, and so um, now I'll tell you a little bit about our move-in day um, for some of you who were with us last year you know a lot of what it takes to get an organization going we have um, bedding, uh, bunk beds, boxes with uh, paper towels and uh, pillows that we need to get organized and move down to our new refuge. Um, this is not just a day for you to get involved and volunteer. This is also a day if you want to just see the new refuge, uh, you are welcome to come down and join us. It will be February 18th. It's going to be from 9 to 3 p.m. And I just put that so that if it takes longer or if you want to just stay a little extra longer you can um, we will need some big trucks and strong men if you're possibly available and um, we will be meeting at Courtney Weir's house where all of our belongings are then we'll load it up take it down to the refuge and um, we'll provide lunch for you guys so there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer if you're if you're looking forward to joining us we would love to have you down that's it thank you guys for the time Thank you, Tim, Kelsey. Well, guys, let's stand up. We're going to say a prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. My name is Bart. I'm the worship pastor here at Center Point. So let's get our hearts ready. Father God, Lord, we come now to worship you, the Almighty God. We're so grateful that we live in a free country where we can do that. And so, Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us in here that your Holy Spirit would lead us, guide us, Father God, in this worship. It is all for your glory. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Some people think you're distant, just some words on a page. But you're nothing more than fables handed down along the way. But I've seen you part the waters when no one else could pull me from the deep. Just who you are to me.
trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now I long to breathe the air of heaven, pain is gone, and mercy fills the street. Be no more. 
Jesus, do 
Thank you, Courtney. Well, let's pray, Lord. Thank you for making us clean. Thank you for the sacrifice that was required to wash our sins away. We thank you for our time together and in worship with the music and the lyrics to direct our hearts toward you, to remind us of who you are and what you've done. And as we continue now in worship by opening your word, we ask that your spirit would teach us. Convict us, encourage us, draw us close, meet our needs. Lord, make us more like yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, I hope that you and your mind can see it as a, a divine appointment. This is, this is not what we gather for is to check a box. It, it is in obedience to Hebrews where it says to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I hope you've already been ministered to, either through the music that we've been enjoying or maybe even in the conversation during the meet and greet. Maybe you met someone new and maybe somebody blessed you in some way with a, just a word of kindness, a, a word of welcome, especially for those of you that are visiting with us. I hope you sense this is family and we are here together to learn, to grow to, again, as Hebrews says, to provoke, to stimulate each other to love and to good works. We have been talking about, since the beginning of the year, the Lord's command for us to watch and to be alert and to be awake and to be ready for his return. There's also the warning that came with it that we need to be careful that we don't become so weighed down with the cares of this life and so busy with all that's going on that we kind of get distracted or get preoccupied and that we're not ready for his return. And we've tried to emphasize over and over and over again that in obedience to that command, we are preparing not just for ourselves, but for those around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, the people that we work with, the people that we do community with. And if we are not alert and awake and paying attention if we're not going to be the ones to warn and to remind everyone around us the Lord is coming back, then who can we depend on to do that? Who can we depend on to remind all of us what we need to be reminded of? Last week, really, we, uh, we asked the question, what is it that God wants out of us? What does he want from us? And of course, the one word answer is just simply this, it's fruit. That's what he's after. He's after fruit. And we looked at that through the parable of the pounds or the minas. And today we'll follow up with another very similar question. Why are we here? What's God's purpose in allowing us to remain on this earth after we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ? And again, the one word answer is going to be fruit. But if we expand it just a little bit, it's just Simply this, it's in order that we might bear fruit. God created us to be fruitful. And we are moving through this subject and into evangelism and into, you know, literally many ways to be fruitful in these weeks and months ahead because I feel like it's so critical that you and I understand whatever analogy you want to use, you want to use whatever sports is maybe your favorite, we are running out of time. If we are in the ninth inning, it might even be the bottom of the ninth inning. I don't know if there's one or two outs, but we don't have much time left to love on those around us, to show them Christ by our actions, to care for each other, to minister to each other, because time is getting short. Darkness is setting in. It's spreading across not just our nation, but around the world. And if we are going to be able to stand before the Lord one day and hear him say, well done, we need to be busy now. And so that's really what these, these parables are all about. I wanted to go back to the parable of the pound just quickly and try to draw together a few loose ends and maybe do a little bit of clarifying because um, we kind of ran out of time last week and this is such an important thing for us to really get a firm handle on. 
You remember in Luke chapter 19, the parable that the Lord taught, he taught because they supposed, the crowd that was traveling with him on the way to Jerusalem, they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. And so Jesus tells this parable to dispel that notion, to correct that wrong thinking. I am not here to set up the kingdom the way that you want me to set up the kingdom. I am here to prepare for the kingdom being set up. I'm here to to pay the sacrifice price in order to make the kingdom possible, but I'm not going to set it up right now. And so he tells this parable about a man who, who calls 10 servants together. He gives them each about three months worth of um, money. And he says, I want you to live and engage in business. I want you to do the best you can to turn a profit for me. The parable continues on. The first one, you know, works real hard. He's able to, to bring in tenfold. The second one works real hard. He's able to bring in five. Fivefold, But when we get to verse 20, it says here, then another came, another servant came. And out of the 10, this is the only other one that's mentioned. Now, I mentioned last week that in the Greek, that language has the ability to be extremely specific with even the most, you know, normal words. And this word another in the Greek literally means another of a different kind. And so you and I have to decide, does that mean that this servant is a different kind of a servant in that he wasn't profitable at all? And is that what that word means? Or does that word mean that he was a different kind of servant because he really wasn't a true servant? And that's critical for you to think about and for you to wrestle with. And so he comes back, and in essence, he says, I don't like you much, Master. I don't have a very high opinion of you. I have absolutely no relationship with you. I really don't care about your kingdom. And so, therefore, I didn't do a thing with your money. Here it is. Take it back. It's yours. And the Lord condemns him with his own words, and he calls him a wicked servant. And again, I asked the question last week, Can you think of a place in Scripture where Jesus calls his children wicked? Where he calls them or describes them as being worthless or useless? And I can't. We are going to be careful to not try to read too much in. This is a parable. This is a made-up story that Jesus made up to make a point. And the main point of this parable is that while the master's gone, you and I need to be at work. We've been given gifts. We've been given things to invest for him. The point is we really, really need to be careful to be busy about our father's business. But this servant is described as being wicked. He is uh, described as being, and we'll find out a little bit later, useless or worthless because he didn't even make an effort. He didn't even try. And it reminded us of 2 Corinthians 5.10, which we talked about last week. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the Christian's judgment seat, and only believers will stand before this beam of seat. This judgment seat is all about rewards. It's not about salvation. Salvation question has already been settled This is a gathering of only those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So no unbelievers here. And Paul is simply telling the Corinthians that we're all going to give account for what we've done with what the Lord has entrusted to us during our days on earth. And a follow-up passage in 1 Corinthians, he talks about building on the foundation that the Lord Jesus Christ had, had laid using the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the monies, all the things the Lord's entrusted to us, and that when the day comes, what we have done will be tested by fire to see what kind of work it is, to see whether it's work that was done in obedience to the Holy Spirit, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and not stuff that we did because we thought it would be a good idea or we thought it would be important or that we liked it because it would attract attention to ourselves. Our work as believers is going to be judged. It's going to be tested. It's going to be revealed by fire to reveal what it's all about, whether it was made out of the gold, silver, precious stones, which is eternal, or whether it was made out of wood, hay, and stubble, which is not eternal. And then Paul finishes up with verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And Paul makes this very clear statement that even if, as believers, we stand before the Lord and some, most, or even all of what we've done for him gets burned up, we still don't lose our salvation. We will be saved, even though it'll be by the skin of our teeth. We will go into heaven with literally nothing to show for our time on earth. And that's what Paul is warning the Corinthians about. So I'm going through that again because I want to be careful that we don't confuse what's going on here. I don't want us to think that what Paul is saying is, it's okay if you don't have any fruit. Don't worry about it. You still get to go to heaven. That's not what Paul is saying in this passage. He's simply saying, for those of us who are believers, and that's an established fact because of this judgment, your labor will be tested, and regardless of what the outcome is, you will still go to heaven. But you might not have anything to lay at the Lord's feet as an offering of gratitude. Now, we've talked about this. The whole reward thing for us is maybe a little confusing. We don't work for a reward. That's not why we do what we do. We do it because we love our Lord, because we could never pay him back for all that he's done for us. But the way the Lord has set this up, we're going to get a reward for what we've done. And I've shared this with you so many times. It just blows my mind that we are going to get rewarded for what he accomplishes through us when all we literally have to do is surrender to him and allow him to do what he wants to do in us and through us to accomplish his will, to bring glory to his name, and then in a sense to give us credit for it. And so I don't believe for a second that we're going to be waltzing around in heaven with these crowns on going, see this, you know? Because we didn't do this. He did. And I believe that probably the first thing that we will do when we get rewarded with the crowns that Scripture talk about is that we will lay them at his feet. And we will say, this was all you. And the biggest surprise for both you and me will be this, that he could do so much through you and through me. Because I know me. And you know you. But this is the difference. And the reason I'm going, to, I'm going to belabor that point is because in verse 27 then, he said these enemies of mine. And these would be those that did not want to submit to his rulership. Those that did not want him to rule over them. And he says, I want you to bring them here and I want you to slaughter them before me. And you go, wow, man, he must be having a bad day if, if that's where he's going. But when you think about this in the spiritual context, those who refuse to allow Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, for those who fight him, those who hate him, those who want nothing to do with him, they will spend an eternity separated from him. Where scripture is very clear, in the lake of fire which is no less a description of horror than what the Lord refers to in this parable. Very real, very true, very actual, and it's going to last a really long time. And so we see the difference between the true servants and those who are not servants. And if we jump over to Matthew chapter 25 now, we'll pick up this second parable. It won't take us so long to go through because it's very similar to the one we just finished. Uh, but yet there's enough differences that we believe these were two separate parables that the Lord taught on two different occasions. Both of them are in the same context. In Luke, it was right before he began teaching on the end times. 
in Matthew, which right after he was teaching on the end times, part of the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew chapter 25, the first parable was the parable of the ten virgins. And he told that story simply to remind everybody, you better be prepared. Because I'm going to be gone a whole lot longer than any of you expect. So you better make sure you have everything that you need for an extended delay. When he comes to this next parable, the parable of the talents, he comes now back to, again, to this same subject of, and while I am gone, this is what I want you to do. So we pick up quickly in Matthew 25, verse 14, will be like a man going on a journey, calls the servants together, he gives to them his property, to one he gives five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability, and then he leaves. Now, a talent is a huge amount. It wasn't just the equivalent of three months. It's actually a weight. So if you're talking about gold, silver, or copper, the, the price, the value just all changes. But if we jump into the middle and say a talent of silver would roughly be, in Jesus' day, the equivalent of 20 years labor. So these are massive sums of money. And this master gives just three of them out. One guy gets a bunch. One guy gets half a bunch. One guy gets one. But I love the way the Lord qualifies this. He says each one according to his ability. And not his perceived understanding of his ability, but what the master knew his ability was. And it's the same today. Jesus gives us abilities or opportunities that are based on our abilities, what we can handle. You would be miserable if you were a five-talent person and the Lord just gave you a a, a mere one talent. You would be frustrated. You would be bored. You would have so much, you know, more that you could do, but nothing with which to work it with. And the extreme is uh, the opposite side, just the same. If you were a one-talent person and you're kind of one of those of maybe you might say some of us that we, we can kind of do one thing at a time. And just kind of let us focus on that. Don't distract us. And if you'll give us time and space and not rush us and not look over our shoulder and not criticize us, we can get it done and we can do a good job. But if I were to give you or your master would give you five loads to deal with, you'd crash and burn, right? You'd you'd go crazy because you are not equipped to do that. So the master in his kindness And his infinite wisdom gives to his servants exactly what they can handle. Verse 16, they go, they do what they're going to do. When he comes back in verse 16, the guy that got the five talents, he was proactive, went at once, he went immediately, he traded, he invested, and he was able to make five more talents. Same thing happened with the guy with two talents. The guy with the one talent, yeah, He said literally the exact same thing that the guy in the parable of the minas or the pounds said to his master. I don't like you very much. I really don't care about your kingdom. I really don't care if you get profit or not because none of it's coming to me. So therefore, I'm just going to dig a hole, stick it in there. And then the outside chance that you ever do show up again, then I'll be able to give you your money back. No crime, no foul, right? Well... As the Lord calls them in, verse 19, after a long time, it was a long time, the master comes back home, calls in his servants, and he calls in the guy that made five talents, and he says to him, you know, kind of give an account. How did it go? What happened? And I love this, the the five talent servant said, Master, you delivered to me five talents, and literally, you know, the, the translation could, could be this, see, five talents more. And just like with the pounds, it's not, look what I did with what you gave me. The idea is what you gave me grew five, you know, five times more. It, it doubled. And it wasn't so much me as it was what you gave me, which is kind of the way we look at what God gives us. You know, we'll never stand before him and say, well, thanks for giving me what you gave me. I did a whole lot with what you gave me. No, no, it was like what you gave me when I just got out of the way and allowed you to accomplish it 
He did amazing things. Exactly the same thing with the two. He comes forward. He says exactly the same thing. And then the master to both of those, both the five and the two talent guys, and it's, it's something that you need to be sure you get a hold of, exactly the same praise. God doesn't expect us to do more than we are able. He doesn't expect us to do as much or as little as the guy or girl next to us. He's not going to line us up according to our order of importance or our quarter, uh, according to our level of profitability. He didn't say to the first guy, man, what a great job, and to the second guy, well, okay, you know, not as much as the first guy. No, no, to both of them together, what did he say to them? Well done, good and faithful servant. Excellent job, great job. There's this exclamation where, you know, literally he's saying, slave, excellent and reliable. Way to go. You and I would, you know, kind of think of it in these terms. The Lord would call you by your name. And say, hey man, you did a great job. You worked hard. You were careful. You were diligent. You were always thinking about and praying about and looking for opportunities. And I just want you to know how proud of you I am. Thank you. Thank you. Because in a sense, what the Lord will be saying is, thank you for caring as much as I do about the increase to my kingdom. Thank you for showing me how much you love me by how concerned you are that as many people as possible are part of the kingdom. But good job. And then he says this, I will set you over much. And I tried to encourage you last week. It doesn't mean like, okay, now you got a whole lot more work that you have to do. Let me reward your faithfulness with a job that's 10 times harder than the... No, no, that's not what this is all about. This is just more opportunity. And I love to think of it as, <clears throat> excuse me, as more opportunity for partnership, for, for fellowship. More time sitting around talking about the kingdom with your master, Jesus. More time where he asks you questions. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Well, I don't know. What? Let's, let's, let's talk about this. But more, more face time. And it's not so much that you're being elevated up the corporate ladder as it is that you're being brought in closer to the master. And it's so much more rewarding because you've been faithful with a little. You know, you've just been faithful over this little bit that I gave you. Now I know I can set you over much. You can now go from, from investing to maybe ruling or administrating or organizing. And it's going to be... It's going to be amazing. But then look what he adds to this. Enter into the joy of your master. Can you imagine being invited into the joy of the Trinity? Can you imagine being invited to come be a part of a place where there is so much love and joy? and peace, and contentment, and accomplishment, and satisfaction. Oh, I think there's, there's got to be laughter. There's got to be interaction like you only understand with those who are absolutely the closest to you, those who you would die for, those who you would do anything for. And literally here the master is saying, come on in. Come on in, in a sense, kind of be one of us. And we'll look at that, Lord willing, next week in that high priestly prayer where the Lord literally says to his dad, Dad, I want them to be with me the way that you and I are together. So come on in. Well, we move to the one talent guy. And he says, again, the same thing. You, you gave me a talent. And, and I don't know whether in the back of his mind that he's going, and I was pretty offended because I feel like I'm 
worth a whole lot more than a talent. I think I could have done at least as much as he did. I don't know if there was, if there was anger, whether there was bitterness, whether there was resentment. But he comes to his master and he said, uh, you know what? You're a hard man. You get money from places you don't even invest. And kind of the idea is you are so, so harsh and mean and cruel and exact, exacting and demanding that you just kind of take from wherever you can get it, whether it's really yours or not. And I was afraid. And so I went and I dug a hole and I buried your talent. You know, your talent was never mine. I was never going to do anything with it. Again, because I don't love you. I don't have a relationship with you. I'm not really interested in furthering your bottom line. So I just went and dug a hole and here, it's yours. Take it back. If you can hear the, hear all of the emotion that perhaps is part of this. Well, first thing we need to understand is that fear is never an excuse that's acceptable before the Lord. And you might say, well, yeah, he said he was afraid. He was afraid he might lose it. Sure, he was afraid he might lose it. And he maybe would have lost it. That's kind of always a potential when we're trying to invest what God has given to us for the kingdom. I guess maybe there's always the risk that it won't turn out quite as great as we hope it will. But what I did notice is that he wasn't afraid to insult his master. He wasn't afraid to call him names. He wasn't afraid to accuse him literally of being a cheat, a thief. Wasn't afraid of that. But yet he's using this excuse of being afraid, so I did nothing. And his master in verse 26 says to him, again, literally, wicked servant and lazy. Wicked servant. Again, does Jesus ever refer to members of his family as wicked? Now, he might, he might call us lazy, and there's times when I'm afraid the shoe fits really, really well. But not wicked. Not useless. This uh, one talent man made a, a really big deal out of how his inactivity, his lack of fruitfulness was all his master's fault. Not really his, all his master's fault. And so Jesus says, I'm going to condemn you with your own words. If what you said was really true, if you really did fear me for all of these reasons, then your logical response would have been to at least put the money in the bank and get a little bit of interest. But because you did nothing, all that you really are demonstrating is that you were not afraid of me. You just have no reason to serve me, no relationship that would drive you to do anything for me. And I just need to remind you in this parable, if it sounds like all that Jesus or all that this, this man is after is money, is, you know, it, it doesn't translate over into Jesus' desires. Jesus isn't about wanting money. He doesn't need money. Hey, where we're going, money is going to be used to pave the streets. Money is not going to be needed to buy anything. It's going to be a, no longer a necessity in any way. But what our master is after is he's after fruit. He's after increase. He's after reproduction. That's why in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says this, that he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's why he still isn't back. That's why he's delaying his coming. It's so those who still are thumbing their nose at him and hating him and falsely accusing him will have a chance to come to the place of repentance. And that's why for us time is of the utmost importance. So verse 28, take the talent from him, give it to the one who was the most productive with what had been you know, given to him. And then the Lord gives this, this eternal principle. To everyone who has, more will be given. And let me add a few words in there. To everyone who has eternal life. To everyone who has a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. 
to all of the opportunities and all of the abilities and all of the resources that you have been given, more will be given to you as a child of the king. But you will end up with not just an abundance, but that word really is superabundance. What you will end up with will be off the charts. And if you just want to think about heaven for just a second, yep, that describes heaven. It is so far beyond everything that you and I will ever in this lifetime be able to even think through. And it will all be ours. But then he goes on to say, but the one from the one who has not, and I'll say from the one who has not a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, no no salvation, he's rejected what's been offered to him. To that person, what he did have, and that was an opportunity to accept Christ and to serve Christ using the abilities and the gifts and the resources that God had given to him, he will lose even that ability because at death, everything is finalized. No second chances. No opportunities to get reincarnated and go back and try again. The Lord makes it very clear that at death, judgment follows. And the decision that you die with is the decision that you will spend eternity living out, whether with Christ or without Christ. And then he says in verse 30, and cast the worthless servant. And there again, can you ever think of a place in Scripture where Jesus calls his children worthless? That's not the way our Heavenly Father works. We might be disobedient. <laughs> we might need to be disciplined. And there's all kinds of other adjectives that might apply to us. That the Lord is in the process of dealing with us about. But there's not a time when he looks at us and say, you, my child, are worthless. Because he died to save us. And by saving us, he gave us great worth. We are his son and his daughter. And, uh, and so this worthless servant is being cast into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Every other place you read that description, it's talking about hell. This is a description of a servant who was a part of a serving core but was not a true servant. In much the same way that our churches today are filled with those who are not genuinely saved, not genuinely born again. They do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this will be kind of the way that that will all be fleshed out when they stand before the Lord and they give account for their life. And the Lord says in Revelation, I'll, I'll open the, the book of life and I won't be able to find their name. And he'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And so today, as we, we kind of draw these to a conclusion, the question that just lingers for us, if being fruitful is what the Lord requires as evidence of true and saving faith, then are you a true servant? Are you a true child of God based on the evidence of the fruit that's in your life. And Lord willing, next week we're going to look at what does that fruit look like? Because if you're like me, my first thought is, oh, please don't tell me if I've never led anybody to the Lord that I'm going to hell. And there's so many other ways to be fruitful. Oh, I would pray for every single one of you that before you leave this earth, you will know the joy of watching God draw someone to him through you, or at least partly through you. It is a joy that's off the charts. But did you see the way I said this? You didn't go out and beat somebody over the head and save them. You allowed God to use you to draw them to him. And that's the way this fruit stuff works. It's not me going out and saying, well, let's see, I got a couple hours, let's go get some fruit. It's, Lord, would you use me today? What I say, what I do, how I respond, what I offer to those around me, would you use me today? 
to produce fruit that will last for eternity. Are you a fruit bearer? Are you bearing fruit today? Are you fruitful? One day you'll be able to stand before the Lord and answer that question. Makes a whole lot more sense to answer it for yourself now. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us, your patience with us. Thank you most of all for being willing to cause us to be fruitful because we could never do it on our own. And we ask that you would just cause each one of us to just stop today and look inside and to ask ourselves the question, is there any fruit in there? Am I giving evidence of my salvation through fruit or is it kind of only because I'm saying what I did a bunch of years ago? And Lord, for those of us who maybe don't like the answers that we're coming up with, would you open our eyes and help us to see what you're calling us to do? Whether it's just to fall on our face before you and confess our sins and to ask you to come in to our heart and be the Lord and Savior and fruit producer of our lives. Or whether it's just a rededication to being more involved in the fruit business. I wonder with your heads bowed this morning, just a quick question. Anyone here, by raising your hand, simply say, I'm not sure that there's enough fruit in my life to prove that I'm a believer. Would you just pray for me, Pastor, as we close this morning? How about someone that would say, there's not near as much fruit in my life as there should be, and I want God to have more of me to work with, that I might produce more fruit. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Okay. The Lord sees those hands. He hears that cry. And Father, we commit each one of these folks into your hands, and I'm one of them. I want there to be more fruit. I want to be more involved in bearing fruit. We surrender to you. Father, we, we commit our lives into your hands. We pray that you would begin the pruning process to take away from us what's distracting us, what's keeping us from being fruitful, that we might bear more fruit, that ultimately you would be glorified. Give us a great week. Prepare us for who you have for us to talk to this week and what you have for us to do. And we'll leave the results in your hands and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you as you go. We'd love to visit with you if we can help and encourage you in any way. You're dismissed.